Hi guys, it's Fern Cotton here from the Happy Place podcast. I'm just popping in to tell you about Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, the brilliant new movie starring the icon that is Emma Thompson and Peaky Blinders' Daryl McCormack. The film follows Nancy, a retired widow who hires a gorgeous young sex worker, hoping to fulfil a lifetime's worth of fun and passion that's been missing from her life. Emma Thompson brings the most brilliant, positive, shame-free, life-affirming take on how sex can and should be enjoyed by all women. The new film Good Luck to You, Leo Grants, is exclusively in cinemas on June the 17th. Book your tickets now. Get ready for five days of feasting at Taste of London this 15th to the 19th of June in Regent's Park. Bringing together the best restaurants, bars, superstar chefs, innovative producers and immersive experiences in one stunning location for the largest celebration of food and drink in the capital this summer. Book today and use the code COCKTAIL to get a free premium tails bottle cocktail with every ticket. On sale now at tasteoflondon.com while stocks last. Arrive, Uncle. Hello, welcome along to a brand new episode of Writer's Routine. This week, we're with Ken Follett, a, a hugely successful author. <laughs> Listen to this, sold over 178 million books across 80 countries. He usually writes historical fiction, but he's back with a thriller. It's called Never. Now, we talk about the pressure of huge success when you've got a team working for you and you're kind of writing for them as well I guess also why his outline is crucial across three years of novel writing and why he doesn't want to be too mealy mouthed about things did I use a, a, a Latin or French type word like say malediction when I really should have used a good old fashioned English word like curse. You know, that's the kind of thing that occurs to me in in the rewrite when I'm rekeying stuff. I, I realize that I haven't haven't used the best possible words. A sentence I, I I see a way to make a sentence easier to understand. I want my sentences to be understood instantly. I'd never want I, want, I never want people to read a sentence of mine twice. There is more on the way with Ken Follett in this week's Writer's Routine. Yes. Hello, welcome to the show. It's Writer's Routine. We take a look inside the working day of some of the world's most successful authors. And that's certainly true today. Uh, my name's Dan Simpson. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for following, streaming, coming back, downloading, however you've reached us. I appreciate you being there. Uh, now, what I love most about chatting to the authors I do over the last what 200 episodes or so I, and I hope you enjoy hearing this part of it. So it's the wide range of writers we have. Some are just starting out, some have come to it late, uh, some non-fiction, some memoir, some kids' books, and some enormously massive. Uh, today, it's one of those. Ken Follett has sold over 178 million books across 80 countries. He has a whole staff of people working on everything else, all the contracts, all the legal side of things, all the publicity. They do that so he can just focus on telling his story, on writing pretty much every day of the week. Now, we talk about how much pressure that puts on him, knowing he's providing an income not just for himself, but also for around 20 other people. Uh, now, if you've never heard of Ken before, if you've never read any of his books, uh, he publishes those thick, weighty historical tomes normally uh, with thousands of pages in them. Uh, he's best known for his Kingsbridge series, the, the Pillars of Earth from that went absolutely massive. It's set in medieval times all about building a cathedral. A series was made about it and he's also published 35 other books. Uh, his new one is called Never. It's all about decisions that could lead to World War Three. We talk about researching the story about his china shelf that he's got at home also how he uses pictures that he finds online for his characters how that interweaves with his outline uh, and why he takes like quite a portion of time a substantial portion of time writing a novel uh talking of time i didn't have the longest time ever with ken and we had some tech issues as well uh, which is why at the start I'm going quite frantically trying to make up for lost time is pretty frenetic. 
So I just thought I'd warn you about that. Uh, we jump into it as we always do with what Ken Follett sees around him in the place where he sits down to write. Mainly books. This is my library in my country house and um, all the walls are lined with bookshelves. Um, I also have a kind of um, uh, a, a desk that's kind of three quarters of a circle so I can spin around and access lots of different things. And um, odd things that are in the room, a few guitars, a uh, lot of pictures of my children and grandchildren, uh, a fireplace, and um, I've got the curtains closed at the moment but um, because I'm doing some visuals later. But um, outside, the window is a cedar tree that is 200 years old. What colour are the walls? In here, it's a sort of – this is a rather Victorian house. So the wallpaper in this library is um, cream-coloured with a kind of burgundy Victorian pattern. Now, you've written uh, books a- across many different – Uh, places and times in history just give us a little flavor of some of the books that we'd find on your on your bookshelf behind you what what research materials are there there uh well now let me see this i've still got quite a lot of the books that i read for never which is the book that's published today um they are all they're about china chinese foreign policy the white house uh they're about Predictions that various people have made about the Third World War or mm. war with China. Uh, and also a few, because China was, is so involved in Never, there are a couple of Chinese movies on DVD and a couple of uh, Chinese novels and short stories as well. That's the, that's the China shelf. <laughs> Take us to the um, the desk that's in front of you. You said kind of semicircular, so you've got full scanning all around you. Uh, what detritus do I find on that little trinket? So I know sometimes authors love that kind of thing. I'm not superstitious, so I don't have anything here um, that doesn't have a function. I've got quite a lot of files and notebooks. I've got a letter tray, um, far more pencils and pens than I will need in the next hundred years. <laughs> uh, and a few a few books close to hand that I use all the time. The Dictionary of First Names. Okay. Wh- wh- why? I mean, you're someone who's written, I, I think, 37 books now. Uh, why are you needing a Dictionary of First Names always with you? It's hard to think of them. And, of course, in real life, we don't use very many names. You know, I mean, m- most people are called Richard or William or Edward or, or you know, uh, there's a very limited number of, of first names in, in common use. So you constantly have to – because you want to distinguish between your characters, of course. And my books tend to have quite a lot of characters. So um, – it's often quite difficult to think of a name that you haven't already used for somebody else. And actually, one of my notebooks that's always on my desk, at the back I keep a list of names that I think I might be able to use. Like I've got, I've got here Jimmy Passfield, Al Crockett, Cecil Pressman, Rob <laughs> Appleyard, Bartholomew Small. There you are. They're all <laughs> names that I've come across. Janet G., Pauline Hand, Laura Mallett, Kathy Keithley. There we are, all names that, um, that sort of seem to me like I might be able to use them one of these days. May I ask, are these names coming to you in a, in a fit of inspiration or are you coming across them on a gravestone perhaps and thinking, ah, oh, Kathy Pressman, that'll be great? <laughs> no, I don't, look at, I don't go into graveyards in search of names. Um, no, um, they just... Uh, it, I sit, sometimes I sit, I wake up in the morning, sometimes sit in bed drinking a cup of tea and I just get good names in my head and I write them all down. Um, uh, so what, what, where are we? So you're on your desk, you've taken me through the notebook, you've got the, the, the dictionary of names. What other, I guess, plotting and planning materials are around you? I mean, do I find you with post-it notes, a vast spreadsheet somewhere so you can keep everything in track? Well, there are on the on the bookshelf, which is which is just uh, in front of me, the other side of my computer screens. I have got um, some ring binders. Some have um, uh, 
the the materials that I gathered for never because I still need to refer to those because I'm doing interviews about it, and some uh, refer to the, my next book, the subject of which is a secret. I know what you're going to ask me next, but I'm, I'm not revealing the subject. But so I have when I come across something useful about um, some technical subject, as in in never it would have been, you know, where are the um, missile sites in North Korea. That was quite important. That's quite important in Never, where uh, the, they, have, they have many missiles in North Korea. Some have nuclear warheads and some have conventional warheads. And where are they? Of course, it, it mean, you can, you can discover this from, I mean, the Americans, the CIA can discover this from satellite photographs. And then sometimes they just post the information. So that kind of thing, a map of North Korea showing where its nuclear missiles are. That, that's the kind of thing. I mean, that's gold dust, actually. So coming across something like that, uh, I would print it and, uh, and put it in a file which has similar material. So I've got my files in front of me um, and <laughs> on the same... On the same shelf is the usual paraphernalia of um, bulldog clips and sellotape and elastic bands and all that kind of thing that um, that you use to keep all this stuff together. It's quite a thing when you do a lot of research. You, you do a lot of research and then you're in the middle of writing the book and you think, oh, I know, I read something about that. I know that. I know where those missile sites are now. Now, where the hell did I put that map? <laughs> so it's really important to try and keep all that stuff in order. So that's the ephemera of writing. What about the actual physical practice of it? Is it a laptop screen for you, paper and pen? Are you doing it the old-fashioned way? Talk me through actually how the words get down. Well, I have three screens in front of me. And the middle screen is the one I'm writing on. On the left-hand side, normally, there is an outline of the book that I'm writing. Um, I always start by writing an outline. Uh, and while I'm writing, I refer to it constantly. And when I've written the chapter or the scene, I delete it. So that's a kind of – so that's a, that's a, a, uh, a sort of um, – redacted, if you like, document, um, which basically shows me what I've got left to write. And if I if I planned to put something in chapter one and it just didn't fit, then I keep that scene up on the screen to remind me that I've got to do it at some later point. Otherwise, that story point will go um, unexplained. So that's on the left-hand screen. And on the right-hand screen, I have a, um, a spreadsheet in Excel on which I keep the details of the characters in the story. So as soon as a named character appears in the story, I put an entry in the spreadsheet, the person's name, usually you, their age, if their age has been mentioned when they're introduced, which it usually is one way or another, um, and anything I say to describe them, you know, uh, like um, like uh, a woman may may be there might be a woman who is rather beautiful, although she has a she has a big chin that suggests determination. That's the kind of thing I might say, uh, and and I would make a note. I would paste. I would cut and paste that, copy and paste that, so that I don't a I don't forget that she's got a big chin, or b so that I don't say it twice. Because that, that looks silly, doesn't it? So you don't want to say something like, somebody's got a big chin. You don't want to say that twice. You say it once, and then you make sure you don't repeat it. And then I also, on that spreadsheet, if uh, for the most important characters, I find a photo or a, find a picture of some kind, photo, drawing, painting, of somebody that looks like the person that I'm, that I'm imagining. And I paste the picture into the spreadsheet so that um, I can remind myself. And this is, as, as time goes on, this becomes less and less necessary because the image of the person gets totally embedded in my brain. But in the early times, in the early chapters, when I've got a lot of characters and I'm trying to keep track of them, it can be quite useful to have a picture that just reminds me in you know a tenth of a second that I said, um, that she was a freckled redhead or something. 
and writing is going in the middle. That's on the main screen, I would imagine. I know I know this sounds uh, this might sound very ordinary and tedious, but what software are you writing on? What font are you writing with as well, Ken? Uh, I'm I'm using Word. Uh, I still mourn the passing of Word Perfect, which was much better than Word for me anyway. Uh, I I liked I used a lot of its features that just have never never appeared in Word, but I use Word now because everybody uses it. And um, uh, the font I use is Constantia, which is it's a bit like Times Roman, um, but it's a bit more elegant. I like it better, and actually. Um, uh, Everybody in my office uh, uses it. You know, it's the, like the standard office font. Twelve point I use. Um, I have I have an office um, about a, a, a mile or two from here, uh, and um, uh, the what the, and the, and they run the business. You know, they they deal with all the foreign publishers and they deal with the contracts and all the financial statements and all that kind of thing. And of course fixing up interviews with people like you. And uh, uh, so, that you know, there are 25 people in the office, so it's quite a big enterprise. And um, they all use Constantia. It's the office standard, and I use it as well because I like it. It was gradual. Um, first, it went from one secretary to six people, and then it – I, there wasn't room in my house for any more than that, so we got an outside. We got outside premises, uh, and it went up and up. <clears throat> um, uh, I had the help of an agent for many years. I don't use an agent anymore, but I did for many years. <clears throat> an agent is very useful, especially at the beginning of a career. But as time goes on, you have to take control of all these things yourself. And for, and fortunately, a a big. Uh, um, increase in the the paperwork uh, for my business coincided with um, my wife Barbara retiring from politics uh, at which point I made her an offer she couldn't refuse and <laughs> since then um, she has been she she works full-time managing what's what we now call the follett office and it's 25 pound it really needs a full-time manager i mean and if i i myself tried to manage an enterprise of that size i wouldn't i'd never write a line i wouldn't have time do, uh, how much responsibility do you feel from that has, has it changed the way that you think about storytelling that now it's not just you carving out your imagination entertaining readers you've also got to think about a lot of people that rely on you for an income um it doesn't i don't think it's made any difference um to the way I I write, I've always been conscious from from when I was first successful. I've always been I've always been conscious that that um, uh, a lot of people were relying on me to produce another bestseller because uh, their living was involved. And it, 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 before I had employees of my own, of course, they were my publishers in different countries uh, who all had high expectations. And then there are. You know, there are all the people who are looking, work in bookstores all over the world. And, you know, I know that they think, oh, great, there's there's a Ken Follett this year. We'll do well with that. That's what the books ever say. And um, so, yes, I do think, it, as well as my own pride in, in writing a book that people will love, there's also – I am also conscious that um, – uh, all those, all those other people uh, also also have a very acute interest in whether my next book is any good, and <laughs> um, but it doesn't really change how I write. I mean, I've, I if I had a if I had a smaller audience, I think I'd write in much the same way. Well, I generally wake up early. I don't set the alarm, but I generally wake up between five and six. I get up at six o'clock. Um, uh, and uh, I make tea for myself and my wife, and I, I come to my desk. I don't get dressed because I, the reason for that is that I'm full of ideas first thing in the morning, and uh, I like to get to my desk as soon as possible. And those early hours of the day are quite productive with me. Um, so I work then fairly solidly, um, through to mid-afternoon. Obviously, I take some time to have breakfast and have lunch and shave and all that stuff. Um, but but my day up until that point, up until mid-afternoon, is focused on writing. 
I slightly, you know, I, 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 I'm a little less sharp by the time it gets to three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And so at that point, I stop writing and I do, I look at my emails and, uh, uh, and I usually tweet um, uh, and uh, deal with any sort of uh, questions that come in from the office about business matters. Uh, around about five o'clock, I uh, uh, I leave my desk, leave the library, this library, beautiful though it is, and um, uh, I usually make a cup of tea, and then um, I quite often play backgammon with Barbara. We we find it a nice way to unwind for half an hour in the evening, and um, I'm the cook in the house, so um, I make supper. Uh, and uh, generally have a glass of wine or, or, or to be honest, a bottle <laughs> with supper um, and read um, for an hour or two after supper and sometimes watch uh, a television drama or a documentary. We often watch television for an hour before we go to bed. We go to bed quite early. We go to bed between 10 and 11, and then I'm up again at 6 in the morning. That's the day. When you sit there at... Uh at the very start of the day and you're you're in your pajamas or whatever it is you're not fully dressed you've got all these ideas buzzing around how do you know what it is that you're writing that day you said earlier on on one of your screens you've got a vague outline uh is that day specific? So you sit there and think, right, now I need to crack out so many words of this chapter. How does that part of it work? No, uh, what, what the outline tells me is what's next. Um, I actually begin by reading what I wrote yesterday. I, I, th- I think most people do that, but I certainly always do that. And I always improve it. It's always, there's all, there, are always, there are always shortcomings. So I read what I wrote yesterday, and then when I've dealt with that, um, I continue either continue the scene or begin the next scene or the, or the next chapter. And yes, the outline. By the way, it's not a vague outline. It's a very precise outline. I take a long time to produce it. I, it, it can take six months to a year, uh, and um, it's, it's quite precise. It tells me what happens in every chapter and who the people are. Um, we will. I will get into how forensic that is in in, in just a sec. Uh, when you sit there of a of a day, is is there an aim for how much you want to get done? A, a word count in mind? What constitutes a good writing day for you, Ken? Um, uh, five pages, which is about one thousand two hundred and fifty words, is a good day. Um, less than four is a bad day. It means that I've run into some kind of obstacles and have taken. Had, it's taken me some time to get over them. Uh, and, of course, um, if I'm in full flow, especially when it comes to uh, towards the end of the book, when, you know, all the pre- pa- preparatory work is complete and, um, in a way, I'm just uh, watching the dominoes fall over. So at the end of the book, I might write um, more, you know, eight, nine, ten pages in a day. How perfect do those words need to be on your first draft? Oh, well, um, uh, they're never perfect, but um, I I do, I, I, um, I do every correction that I think of. So, um, you know, if I've written, uh, if I've written a hundred pages and I realize that I've, 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 I'm steering in the wrong direction. Um, I, I go back and, and redo the whole thing. I never, I never say, oh, that I'll co- correct that in the rewrite. I never do that. Um, if I, if I thought of it, I would do it. Um, there'll be, there'll always be plenty to correct in the rewrite. I won't be short of stuff to do. Um, so it, it, it's not that it has to be perfect because I don't. I, I mean, it's 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 never perfect, but if if there's a way to improve it, and I've noticed there's a way to improve it, I have to do it. What is there during the day? You mentioned various moments where you'll stop for breakfast and to have a shave. When, when you're when it's a hard day and and the words are struggling to come out uh, along your thirty seven books, have you learned anything that just helps unclog things a bit? Maybe a piece of music at a certain time, a cup of coffee. No, I'm afraid um, that kind of thing. I don't have any of that. Those things. I used to smoke cigarettes, and um, of course, 
uh, when I started writing full time, my consumption went up, you know, doubled, and um, I, I I had to uh, I had to discipline myself so so that I didn't light a cigarette every time I had to stop and think, which is absolutely fatal. And and for for, for some years, I used to smoke a sit one cigarette every hour on the hour as a way of of preventing myself from smoking 40 or 60 cigarettes a day. Uh, that was always helpful, by the way. Lighting a cigarette was always helpful, but I don't do that anymore. And uh, thank goodness. And um, so there is – Barbara, my, my wife Barbara says that I, I, she knows when I'm stuck because I walk up and down a lot. And I, had, I wasn't conscious of that until she pointed it out to me. But I suppose that must be true. Um, uh, it doesn't really make any difference, and you really are better off sitting in front of the screen because then, you know, you, your hands are ready to write it, and thinking about it is is, you know, thinking about it's no good. You've got to write it down. So anyway, um, uh, I don't have a magic formula. I just a friend of mine from. Um, from the northeast of England used to use the phrase nut it out meaning work it out but work it out like I bang it's like bang you know it's a cross between working it out and banging your head on the wall and he used to say nut it out and that's what I do I nut it out I just chew away at it until I think of something Get ready for five days of feasting at Taste of London this 15th to the 19th of June in Regent's Park. Bringing together the best restaurants, bars, superstar chefs, innovative producers and immersive experiences in one stunning location for the largest celebration of food and drink in the capital this summer. Book today and use the code COCKTAIL to get a free premium tails bottle cocktail with every ticket. On sale now at tasteoflondon.com while stocks last. Arrive, right, Hi guys, it's Fern Cotton here from the Happy Place podcast. I'm just popping in to tell you about Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, the brilliant new movie starring the icon that is Emma Thompson and Peaky Blinders' Daryl McCormack. The film follows Nancy, a retired widow who hires a gorgeous young sex worker, hoping to fulfil a lifetime's worth of fun and passion that's been missing from her life. Emma Thompson brings the most brilliant, positive, shame-free, life-affirming take on how sex can and should be enjoyed by all women. The new film, Good Luck to You, Leo Grants, is exclusively in cinemas on June the 17th. Book your tickets now. Hello, Friday listeners. Thank goodness it's Friday, right? The day we've been waiting for. Finally, it's the end of the working week and two glorious days of weekend stretch out ahead of us. Hashtag Friday. You're right. It's not Friday. Things just don't feel right when they're in the wrong space. That's why we're helping businesses find the right space with 60 London locations, your own office and flexible contracts. Space matters. Workspace. We'll have more with Ken in just a sec. A big author on the show today. If you're enjoying learning stuff from one of the most successful writers on the planet, uh, if you've learned anything that might change the way that you tell your stories, if you want to say thanks to us for that, you can do that over on Patreon by becoming a backer at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. You get loads more things available to you. There is bonus content, even more bonus content. Uh, you get our undying thanks you get merch as well there is also a way for your book to sponsor this show it's i think i think this is the 200th episode near enough the 200th episode if any time along the way you've learned something and you would like to say thank you that's what you need to do uh it'll help us carry on bringing you chats with the best authors around as often as we can i don't think i think maybe we've missed one week all year i don't know we very rarely do we miss a Friday um, and you can help that carry on by backing us by pledging over at patreon.com forward slash writers routine. Let's get back to it with Ken Follett then uh, all about his new novel Never, uh, the events that could lead to World War Three. In this half, we talk about how the process starts, what happens when he has the outline and how he moves on with that. Also, why he wants his sentences to be understood straight away. Uh, and he tries to be quite direct with them. And we pick things up talking about the writing routine of a year. Uh, he's such a, a machine of storytelling. He sells so many books. When he's finished one, 
how does he reset himself to start again? When I've finished, finished a book, which means really that that the second draft has been reviewed by my editors. They've made a few suggestions. I've tweaked it and I've then sent it back to them and I've sent it to all the translators. That's, 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 that's a point at which I can start working on something new. I sometimes say to myself that I ought to take a couple of weeks off and, and let, the, let the well fill up, but it never works because after a few days – something will occur to me and I'll think, I wonder if that would make a story. And I, I start working on it. I start elaborating it. I might read a book that's relevant, of, you know, a factual book, bit of research. And really, um, pauses just – I don't take – I don't get much pleasure from stopping work. I get pleasure from doing the work. So, um, so it would be almost immediate after I feel that I've finished a book, I almost immediately start another one. And then normally, if it's a long historical novel, I would allow a year for the outline, a year for the first draft and a year for the rewrite. That would be my normal practice. And many, uh, some of my novels have taken longer, longer than that. Um, Pillars of the Earth was a bit longer than that. Sometimes they might be six months shorter. Never, of course, is not a long historical novel. And I, and I wrote it in lockdown, so it was much quicker. But my normal practice, I would allow three years. And, uh, and uh, the, that initial period of writing the outline and doing the initial research is absolutely crucial. And is this five days a week of work? It is now, yeah, now. Uh, there have been times when I've worked seven days. The When the publishers read the first draft of Never, uh, they were very, very keen, and they said, they said, please, 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 can't you rewrite it faster than normal so that we can publish it next year instead of the year after? And, you know... <laughs> Dan, when your publishers are that excited, you you don't sort of turn your back on them and say, "No, I can't be bothered to write 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 any faster." You say you say to them, "I'm so glad you love it so much, and I'm going to break my neck to do what you want." And um, so so never was written much more quickly. But the general pattern is a year for for that that rewrite. And I don't when I rewrite, I don't edit, I key the whole thing. And that's because when I read my own sentences, I'm a bit inclined to think think that that's brilliant, Ken, you're a genius. But when I actually key them, uh, I I can I get focused on ways to improve them, and I find ways to improve the sentences that I didn't notice when I was just reading it. Uh, so it's it's it has turned out that that literally rewriting is an important discipline for me. It makes me more perfectionist, more particular about, you know, um, the way, the weight of words in the sen in a sentence. Did I, um, you know, did I use a, a, a Latin or French type word like say malediction when I really should have used a good old fashioned English word like curse, you know, that's the kind of thing that occurs to me in, in the rewrite when I'm rekeying stuff. I, I realize that I haven't, haven't used the best possible words, a sentence. I, I, I see a way to make a sentence easier to understand. I want my sentences to be understood instantly. I'd never want, I want, I never want people to read a sentence of mine twice um, they must, if, if the sentence is any good, they'll get it as soon as they look at it. So, and, but that comes with a, a bit of perfectionism in the rewriting. Well, it starts uh, when I have the very first idea, I might typically write down three paragraphs and then I'll think about it. And the next day I might write a page and the, and the next day, two pages. And quite soon I get to the point where it's actually taking me a whole week to rewrite the outline. And it's getting more elaborate all the time. By the time I finish the outline, it's about 50 typed pages. And it says, it'll say chapter one, and then there'll be a name, uh, as it might be um, in Never. Chapter one begins with Tamara. There was a young woman CIA agent in 
uh, working in Chad, a North African country in the Sahara Desert. So, so I might say, I would say Chad, uh, I would say Tamara is uh, 30 years old. Uh, she's from Chicago. She's working in the American embassy in Chad in North Africa, and she is an agent for the CIA. Today, she is driving to an oasis in the desert called Lake Chad, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and who's with her, um, what she looks like. Uh, and it's very, very important early, early in the story for a main character, what are her hopes and fears about life in general? What is she passionate about? So from, so as it happens, uh, uh, Tamara is is passionate passionate about freedom and that's why she's joined the cia because she really believes in that american virtue of freedom sorry to interrupt there ken uh, these the, the passions and the hopes and the dreams how are they coming to you is it flights of inspiration or is it studious brainstorming um they I, i'm not a great believer in flights of in, inspiration um, you know, this this woman is going to be involved in quite a dangerous adventure uh, and she's going to be willing to risk her life. So there must be something about the job that makes her willing to do that. Uh, and so in some ways, her character has to grow out of the story that I've invented for her. Um, but then also comes a point a little further into the story where I'm starting to think now, we know her basic characteristics. Uh, we know what she wants out of life. But what else? Does she have hobbies? Uh, what are her parents like? Does she have a brother or a sister? How does she feel about her brothers and sisters? Uh, what was school like for her? Was she a good scholar? Was she badly behaved? What about her first boyfriend? What was he like? Who was the first person she fell in love with? That kind of thing. These things may not be directly connected with the story, but this is how she becomes, to me and to the reader, how she becomes a real person. Before you start, I, I guess when you've invented this character, Tamara, and, and you're, you're, you're going to plop her in this situation, how much do you know about the entire thing before you even outline? Uh, I mean... Do you know the beginning, the middle, and the end already, or does that kind of come to you as you're figuring things out? Well, it's it starts with it's, it's hard to answer that actually, but it starts with a notion that it, that gets me excited. So, um, in the case of Never, uh, I was thinking about the First World War and how nobody really wanted it, and and it was caused by a series of decisions. Which, which the people making the decisions didn't think they were building up towards a world war. And I, th and, my, and I then thought, could that happen now? And I then thought, can I make a story about that? So I knew from the start that there was going to be a global crisis that threatened to start the first that start the third world war so that was the that's the central notion that's the one sentence that um sums up the idea that came to me and so i guess i knew right from the start i knew that that, that at the end of the book we would get close to world war three i didn't actually know whether it would happen or whether um, there would be some way out of it or some alternative ending. And, of course, now that the book's out, I'm, I'm not going to say because you know, they, the readers won't find out until the very last page how it ends. But, but, but I certainly knew right from the start that, that what, I knew what happened on the page before last. I didn't know what happened on the last page. Uh, and, and just lastly, Ken, as I say, uh, writing is quite often a method of self and analysis. You're always getting better. Uh, otherwise, why would you do it? Uh, I don't know if this is still the same for you as you've written so many books. Is there anything about the way that you work, the way that you write, the way that you tell the stories that you would like to improve on going forward? Uh, I hope that's not presumptuous. There may be nothing. And if that's the case, that's fine. Uh, no, uh, no, um, no. I, I, I constantly, when I'm reading, I constantly think, now that's a really good way to, to tell this part of the story. And I must remember that. I think I do that all the time with all kinds of 
uh, all kinds of writers. You know, I, I read the Victorians a lot, and and I recently read the Mystery of Edwin Drood, the Dick, Charles Dickens unfinished novel, and I found myself doing that. I found myself doing. Thinking, thinking, I must write more like this. Of course, I'm never going to be able to write. Nobody can write like Charles Dickens, but you know what I mean. I think I see the things he does. Dickens has this marvelous thing called uh, as if he writes as if he says, uh, uh, you know, he'll say something like it, it was raining, it was raining so hard, it was raining as if uh, the Almighty had had uh, left a tap on up in heaven and all the water in the universe was pouring onto this village. He'll do that as if all the time. And it always leads to a hyperbolic sort of image, which is brilliantly affected. And I was saying, of course, I can't do it like him, but I was thinking, well, I could do it a little bit like that. Couldn't I put one or two of those things in? And I think that all the time. That is it for Ken Follett on this week's show. I hope you learned something. I hope it might change the way that you tell your stories. Maybe it'll impact your day. If it does, you can always say thanks. Uh, pledge to us. Become a backer at patreon.com forward slash writer's routine. Uh, next week, we're with Joanne Harris, MBE, best known for Chocola. Uh, became the movie with Johnny Depp in the early noughties. Yeah, she wrote it and she's t- on next week to talk about her new one. It's magical realism thriller in there as well. It's called A Narrow Door. That's next week. In the meantime, uh, you can get in touch, writersroutine.com. You can drop us a follow on Twitter. We're at writerspod there. And uh, a review on Apple always goes a long way. Uh, if you have the time, it takes like a minute. I would really appreciate that. And I'll see you next week with Joanne Harris on the show. Until then, bye. Hi guys, it's Fern Cotton here from the Happy Place podcast. I'm just popping in to tell you about Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, the brilliant new movie starring the icon that is Emma Thompson and Peaky Blinders' Daryl McCormack. The film follows Nancy, a retired widow who hires a gorgeous young sex worker, hoping to fulfil a lifetime's worth of fun and passion that's been missing from her life. Emma Thompson brings the most brilliant, positive, shame-free, life-affirming take on how sex can and should be enjoyed by all women. The new film, Good Luck to You, Leo Grants, is exclusively in cinemas on June the 17th. Book your tickets now. Get ready for five days of feasting at Taste of London this 15th to the 19th of June in Regent's Park. Bringing together the best restaurants, bars, superstar chefs, innovative producers and immersive experiences in one stunning location for the largest celebration of food and drink in the capital this summer. Book today and use the code COCKTAIL to get a free premium Tales bottle cocktail with every ticket. On sale now at tasteoflondon.com while stocks last. Arrive, Great.